everybody. Today I have with me the Senior Associate Director of Athletics, Dee Dee, call sign Dallas Allen at the University of Alaska. Now she has been in college athletics for over 30 plus years. So you can imagine the breadth of uh, changes that she has seen after Title IX. And here's a woman who is, is in the administration, has been involved and uh, has a lot to say. Uh, a couple of things that I really dove into is, uh, is this first off, we actually get into a deep story about um, mental fitness or, or mental health. And uh, it's a story about someone uh, attempted suicide and actually a, a suicide that really impacted her and the other athletes. But more importantly, uh, the impact that has come out from that, you know, and uh, mental health is a challenge that we have to address. We all know that. Uh, and, and we came up with some pretty cool ways. Uh, she has faith. Number one is, is a huge, uh, a huge point of for her. We also talked about uh, don't be afraid to start at the bottom. I said, I asked her, I said, Hey, how does a woman, how does anybody get started in athletics, college athletics, uh, especially in administration? She goes, Hey, I got out of high school or I got out of college. They created a job for me. And uh, it's a beautiful story. We'll dive into there. There's also this idea of praying for a miracle. Uh, that's something that, that actually came through. So with that, uh, let's dive in to Dallas and Gucci. This is not just about college athletics, but actually life. Here we go. Ready? Hit it. Hey, everybody. I got Dee Dee Allen, who is the Senior Associate Director of Athletics for Alaska Seawolves. And uh, Dee Dee, you've had a career in Division I National Athletics. Uh, a lot of stories we can unpack. But first off, I just want to say thank you. And I can't wait to uh, dive in. Glad to be here. Great to be here, John. Thanks for having me. So, so Didi, what is a, a, a senior associate director of athletics? Tell me what that role is and how long have you been part of uh, athletics? You know, I got into athletics um, by mistake. Um, uh, <laughs> I, uh, my undergraduate was um, in uh, financial management okay. and uh, really didn't intend to go the direction of, of athletics. That was not my intent and started working in my alma mater's athletic department as a lifeguard. Which was and where? Where'd you go to school? You go I to went school? to um, the University of North Carolina at Asheville. Oh, you did? Tar yeah. Hill. Oh, wait, yep. Asheville. That's Asheville, different. the yeah, Bulldogs. The yeah. Bulldogs. Yeah. S sister institution to the Tar Heels, but no, right. other side of the state. Okay. And uh, Asheville's you know, so, a happening place now. Was it that uh, when you were there? No, it was a sleepy town yeah. when I was there. Yeah. Um, great, still a great town, um, yeah. but it's it has grown and developed quite a bit since since I was there. Um, great institution, liberal arts, had a great experience there. Um, but I just happened to apply for a job and it was year round. And because I just kept sticking around, I ended up working box office concessions, um, then scheduling the facility, um, just had all sorts of opportunity. And I stuck around for so long that they ended up creating a position for me wow. after I graduated. Wow. And um, that's how I ended up in athletics. <laughs> wow. So, well, that's, that's a great message for anyone who's listening, you know, that when you go to school and you, you make the effort that they create a job just because well, of, of you, that's amazing. Well, and I mean, they, one of the messages that I would, tell people is that you don't start out as you know an assistant athletic director or um as an associate athletic director I mean I really did start out at the bottom I was a yep. lifeguard and I just learned different parts of the operation wow. um you know which was facilities intramurals um and I did apply my my business degree I mean I ended up doing the business management side of things for several years. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I started out at the bottom. I mean, literally. <laughs> so, well, 
I, I think, I, I, at least I hope, most people who have accomplished and gotten to the level you are, you know, did start at the bottom or, or close to it, right? And have to work your way up. I know that's true in aviation and it's true in so many careers. Um, what benefits did you gain from starting at the bottom? Well, to where are you now? Yeah, because I I learned how everything worked. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have to worry about it. if something went wrong. I knew how to fix it. Wow. <laughs> Whether it was you know it, 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 from the facility side, um, I knew where the lights were. If you know, I mean, and and shockingly, um, when a new athletic director came in, I had been running a, a camp a conference all summer long. And, um, he, you know, when everything was over, he was like, you know, I was expecting all sorts of complaints and I didn't get any, and I have an idea that you're the person responsible for that. Wow. Um, so, you know, as a, like, I, I think I had just graduated. Um, and I was the one signing contracts for the facility and, wow. At this point in my career, I can't imagine entrusting that level of responsibility to a, a you know, a, a college graduate or right. just soon, but it just ended up that it was just, I mean, that was, well, I'm not going to tell you how many years ago that was, but it was a long right. time ago. <laughs> Uh, brilliant. But, you know, I mean, I, I do want to hear and everybody, you know, the, the business of college athletics, it's, it is a business, right? It's also a student Absolutely. athlete and all that, but it's yep. a business and we're, we're yep. going to dive into the business side of it. Um, but I, I just, something you said just sparked me. You said you were given the trust as a brand new college, um, you just graduated to, to sign facility contracts and knowing what you know now, you wouldn't do that to somebody else. So, so that's a little contradictory there, right? Um, well, I mean, now things are so complicated mm. and so legalistic. And mm. I, I'm just not sure I would put anybody else in that position. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's do. good. So, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to unpack it as a leader myself. You know, when do you give somebody, um, you know, responsibility yeah. uh and we always know we want to do that and grow, but oh, you, absolutely. Just, you just brought a good point up is you don't want to put them in a spot that they're not ready for, or, or maybe you do. I don't know. See, that's what yeah, I'm going back I mean, and, and it is, it's hard, but you know, and I never at that time of my life and it's kind of part of my personality. I just kind of, I just charge ahead unless yeah. somebody like is kind of like having me back going, uh, hold on there. But I didn't, there was nobody in a leadership position at the time because we were between athletic directors okay. and there were, there wasn't anybody else there. And so there was kind of an absence of mm -hmm. anybody running the show and things were happening. And I just knew that I needed to make it work. Yeah. So I was going to make it work. And I did. Wow. So, you know, as, as you're talking, what just hit my head is, and I think this is true with any leadership position, there's no right or wrong answer. There's no black and white, you know, nope. oh, we should give people, uh, you know, uh, stretch them, put them over. There. Sometimes, you know, not because of the legal thing. I think it's, it's all situational, but what do you think made you successful in that? Um, you know, that's a great question. Uh, you know, part of it, um, I had a great education, <laughs> um, you know, and I think I, you know, my parents had certainly given me a good foundation. Um, I mean, I had, I had integrity. Um, I had some of the baselines in terms of, okay. you know, of doing things the right way. Um, and there were certainly other people there who I knew I could go to. Oh, good. But for for whatever reason i must have been operating within the lines because yep. nobody was going uh what's going on down there <laughs> <laughs> uh there's something something's going on um That's so um it yeah so I, you know in retrospect that many years ago i'm not sure what made me successful yeah but 
uh, probably a little naivete. Um, yeah, and sometimes that's good. Um, and um, uh, I've always had a healthy dose of self confidence of yeah. going, you know, I'm, I can do it. I'll get this done. And, you know, Later. and hopefully n- not too much ego that, yep. that I'm going to do something, you know, stupid. Um, and I don't think that I did. I kept things, you know, kind of within the, within the, within the lines. <laughs> well, I like what you said here real quick. And, and by the way, I hadn't planned to go this direction right away, but it's kind of, it's a good lesson for a lot of things. One is I love what you said within the guardrails or, or the, the lines you said, right. And I think that's important when we um, are bringing new people in and yourself is to know where those guardrails are. You know, somebody obviously set some guardrails for you. You knew when you were pushing the limit or or outside. Um, And then you also had that desire. You know, I I think about like um, flying jets off aircraft carriers. You know, I had a lot of the same uh, components you did. I had a good education. I was trained. Um, I was self-confident, but not overly, right? Because that can get you into big trouble, right? But, but you, and then you had the desire to figure it out, the desire to make it work, right? And I think that's what I'm hearing in your story is when you combine those and you have the support around you, somebody you can ask if you're not sure, um, you can get, you can accomplish amazing things. Yeah. Well, and I'd been there. I mean, it was my alma mater, right? Okay, so good. I must have you known knew. enough about the culture there or sensed go. enough that I wasn't going to do anything to harm a place yeah. I cared about, right? Um, and so there's that. Um, yeah. And it was a smaller, I mean, at the time, UNC Asheville was a, you know, a smaller liberal arts. They've grown since I left, but yeah. So nice. Yeah. Nice. Okay. I got, I got an idea. Let's um, look at you're wearing your colors. I love yes. this. Okay. Anchorage, the sea wolves, right? Yep. Okay. Yep. But what, what are you wearing underneath? Let's see what you got. We match, on, John. Girl. We match. Glad there to be it here. Is. <laughs> the glad to be here. Yep. And, and the fact, uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, let's to toast. Here. toast. The glad to be here mugs. Okay. Uh, so people are probably saying, well, wait a minute, why, why, why does she have all that stuff besides yep. sugar? My producer sending you this. this y- yeah. Yeah. Greg actually, hooked me up. <laughs> he did hook you up, right? Um, but there's actually a, a deeper story. So um, yep. tell, tell, let's, let's have a conversation. When, when did we first meet and what was the context around it? Yeah. Um, it was June of 2013. Um, and the the context is is really meaningful to me because i i began having what i'll call professional firsts in my career um and not good firsts right that's right? something i wanted to to stress in because when you said professional first, I think of good things. Oh, I accomplished this. I'm getting yeah. the opportunity as a woman in athletics to do this. But and I've had a lot about- of great, I mean, great yeah. ones of those um, really positive ones that I'm uh, feel really grateful for. Um, but this is these different though. Yeah. were very different um, ones that I felt, uh, well, I mean, they were just they were ones that really kind of knocked me off my pens, quite frankly. Okay. Um, in the spring of 2011, we had a student athlete who committed suicide, mm. um, had never had that happen in, you know, a, a 20 year career, right. um, had certainly heard of it at other institutions, um, had, had colleagues who had experienced it, but had never personally experienced that. Um, very difficult, um, you know, to watch, you know, student athletes, teammates of this young man, um, grieve, you know, the coaches, um, it was just a very difficult time. Um, and, and then, you know, kind of move through that process, um, doing your best to support the student athletes, the coaches. Um, and then 
knowing that it had affected one of his teammates more so because they were distant cousins, teammates from the same village in Kenya. Mm. Um, And then that fall, this young man um, attempted something similar, but in a very different manner. Um, And this actually became very public. So I can, I can talk a little bit more freely about it. Um, But he basically ran off into the snow and that one was, that one was even more, I mean, it, not more horrific, but it wasn't like it was just done. I mean, it, it happened on a Sunday. We gathered as a staff in a, you know, kind of in an operations control area as mm-hmm. we're you know, hearing updates on search and control or, you know, search and rescue. We have search and rescue. We actually had a coach who did um, search and rescue um, with his dogs. I mean, we have skiers out, we have helicopters out. I mean, I mean, all of the resources that we could gather. Um, And we're looking for Marco. Um, He was a pretty incredible runner. So we had no idea how much distance he was able to, to cover. And by like 5.30 in November, it's dark and they called off the search Mm. and everybody's stomach just because you you just, you don't know, well, you have a bad feeling. And And just context again, this is in Anchorage. Anchorage, Alaska. Alaska. So what time of year? November. It's cold. Cold. Yeah. Um, fresh blanket of snow. Yep. Um, and I remember going home, not feeling very, very hope, very hopeful, but I remember waking up the next morning and it was just like, you know, this is just too much for, for me personally. Um, and I have a great faith. Um, so I went to my church, I had keys cause I was doing a lot of, um, gardening for them at the time. And I had keys to the sanctuary. And I knelt at the altar and I laid it at the altar because it was just too much for me. And, and I prayed for a miracle. Hmm. And that day, you know, as we're all kind of struggling to manage this incredible grief and hope and all sorts of emotions. Yeah. You know, our boss, our boss calls us in, our athletic director at the time, Steve Cobb, and says, you know, this is a horrific situation, but we've got 173 other athletes who need you. We have coaches, we have events. So, you know, it's tough, but chin up and make sure that you're You know, and I just remember there was part of me that just wanted to hate him for, you know, for saying, for saying that, because all I wanted to do was like focus on all of the emotions that I had about that situation. But then the other part, the, the, the realistic side was, you know, he's right. I can't, we can't get lost in this. We can do whatever we can, but those, the other student athletes are also suffering and, and they need our attention. And there are other student athletes who really don't know Marco, but they've got stuff going on. And yes, we have, you know, we've got a hockey, um, hockey series coming up. We've got basketball games coming up and we need to focus on the here and now and as much normalcy as we can. Mm. So there was just so much going on and, and, and having to um, somewhat uh, compartmentalize. And I'm sure you have had to do that in your career a number of times, but compartmentalizing some of those, some of those emotions. And then 
that night, late, I got a call. We found Marco. Hmm. And I'm bracing myself for the in what condition like Mm -hmm. it was like oh okay he awoke and and miraculously was there's your prayer there's my miracle he awoke the 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 deep snow fall that we'd had actually insulated him Mm. And he found his way back to um, a facility. They called an ambulance, got him to the hospital. Um, he did end up losing both of his feet, however, through frostbite. Um, his mm. hands were frostbitten, but he, he, uh, um, he maintained all of his digits. Mm. Um, and now, I mean, it, there's, a, there's a great article about Marco on ESPN. Um, in an ESPN magazine, you can Google it. Um, when he woke, um, he was so sad about his cousin and, and felt horrible that he had not somehow been able to, um, stop his, his friend from committing suicide that he ran out into the snow after swallowing a bunch of pills. He felt that if God had saved him, that there was that he had further a further plan for him. Right. And since then, Marco has become this incredible spokesperson for, you know, mental health and suicide prevention. Um, he runs marathons on his blades. Wow. Um, he finished his undergraduate with us. He went on to get his master's with us. Um, he married, he has children. I got my miracle. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So now, mind you, I didn't know all of that when I was going through that first right. at that very moment. Um, but I had to give you the good part um, in the middle of that. Um, so Marco ended up being a, an incredible story. <clears throat> um, but so, so going through, so that's November of 11. Um, Can I just ask you something before we go? Yeah. Onto the next part, which I, I want to get to. What did what did you learn from that experience, both of those experiences that you have found has been helpful for yourself and others? Um, I think, you know, the one thing that, and I think I've kind of always had a sense of this, is that you never know what somebody else is going through ever. Right. Um, And so whether it's, you know, kind of reaching out and trying to um, make those very, uh, or, you know, make those uh, relationships with student athletes as quickly as you can, um, and making sure that they all know that they've got somebody to reach out to aside from their coaches, which we've always tried to do a pretty good job of here. Sure. Um, but I mean, me personally, um, faith has always been a large part of my life. Um, but even more so after that, um, it's, it's, not something that I talk about a lot, Mm -hmm. um, but it's definitely a foundation of everything that I do in terms of, you know, my work. um, It's, it's in the background of. So the faith you have that even a deeper commitment to, to faith. Uh, Have you found, and and the reason I'm going to ask this question, it's not, just a tee up, but have you found that you became more grateful yeah. or does gratitude yeah. help you? Absolutely. And why? Um, you know, and I think that anytime there's a, 
whether it's a tragedy um, or e even one of those incredible, you know, experiences, um, it, it reminds us how great life is mm. um, or how, how, well, as, as with Marco, um, you know, you, you go through something that's so horrific yeah. um, and then something great happens and yes. it's like, wow, that just could have been, that could have turned out so much differently. Right. And, and whether we call it a thankfulness or gratefulness, you know, and it, it's funny because, because I know your gratitude practice. Yes. Um, and I do something every morning. It's kind of my, um, as I'm giving the biscuit to the dog, as I'm nice. heading out the door, yep. um, I have this, um, you know, kind of, uh, prayer of, you know, um, thanks and and gratefulness that i say on my way to the car can you share it with us now i mean i'd love to hear it no, no. it's really no it's, okay good it's personal uh, leave it keep it it's keep a it. very personal yeah okay keep it's it. a that's very great. personal thing no that's um, perfect that's perfect but um but anyway it's um you know it's really about um my uh it's a reminder to me of every day yeah. of the things that are in my life that I'm grateful for. Yes. And, and that things are not, are not always great. Right. right? But right. that no matter what, what isn't great, there's still things to be grateful for. Wow. So that's, but faith plays such a large part of it. And it's, and sometimes it's those, it's the, it's, it's the unfortunate things that happen that make us more aware yeah. of what we're grateful for. Unfortunately, yep. sometimes. I was, that I was just on a, a training this morning. We have a, a company that uh, every week we, uh, we do a, an hour training and um, we're over, over a hundred weeks in a row now. So we dive into many different topics. One of them has been depression, suicide, some of these um, challenges, mental health that we all have. And in fact, have actually been um, exacerbated with COVID and all these situations, yeah. right? We know that. I mean, the stats are there. Uh, and, uh, and two thoughts hit my head, right? So the first one was, it was, oh, you know what? This came from a podcast I did uh, just earlier today. This idea of no, no, it was from the training. It, there's so much stuff going on, I can't remember. But the bottom line was here, here, here's what I wanted to share. They said either either something is a blessing or a lesson. And the way I look at it, it's it that's not exactly correct. I look at a lesson as being the biggest blessing because there's something we can learn from it. So I think every lesson is a blessing. Now that's really hard. It's easy for me yeah. to say that right now. We're, we're safe. Yeah. We're warm. Everything yeah. is good. Well, not everything's good, whatever. But the point is um, we're not in the snow, losing our feet with frostbite. I mean, you know, not going through the, the horrific uh, internal challenges that a lot of people are going through. So right. it is, it, I, I'm not trying to downplay it. I'm saying it's easier to say now. But what I think what I'm trying to share with everybody is that at some point, you're going to look back at whatever challenge, you yeah. know, and look what Marco's doing now. Look at the, yeah. the platform that he has that he would yeah. never have. Now, I'm not saying you go through that because of that, but right. it's 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 just the opposite. It's, it's yeah. take every. Yep. So, yeah. Tell me. Go for it. Ex well, exactly. I mean, and and how amazing for Marco to have immediately awakened with that thought. Wow. Did he? You mean he 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 just awakened that's the way he that's the way he told it. So so wait a minute. So he's in the snow uh, and and he's and it's snowed and over his, him. His immediate the way that that I remember it is like you know when I woke up and I realized that I was still alive 
I, God had, that God had a plan for me. Wow. And it was like his, his whole, yeah. Yeah. Read the article. It's if, if you look at ESPN and Marco Chisetto. Yeah. He's just. I'll yeah. do that. In fact, sugar, put it in the show notes so people don't have to search for it. Yeah. Um, it's, and, uh, it's a pretty incredible. Yeah. I mean, he's yeah. just, he's, he is. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, he's just one of my in, most incredible. Uh, yeah. He inspires me every time I see him on my Facebook feed. I just, oh. he, yeah. Yeah. So there's a couple of points I want to pull out because, you know, besides it being an impactful story, I think we all can learn from it. Right. Yep. And in many ways. And one of those things was um, just how uh, I don't want to use the word prolific, but the depression and mental challenges are, like you said, you never can know what's going through another person. No. You really can't. Right. Even even a, a loved one. Right. Um, but the idea of how can we help them? is a real challenge sometimes. Right. And yeah. here's what's it's what, here's, what's interesting. What were you going to say? No, you know, well, no, what I was going to say was, you know, and particularly with student athletes, you, yeah, you don't, me. it's so hard because student athletes have this, what I call, and it might be, um, it, and it may be this way with pilots too. It's like what I call t- 10 foot tall bulletproof syndrome. Yeah, exactly. Nope, not me. Yep. Nope. I'm good. Nope. I'm good. Yep. Nope. I'm good. Not me. Exactly. Nope. Right. And you know, when we try to tell them, Hey, look, you're going to, you're going to bump up against something in your life. That's going to spill into your classwork mm-hmm. and your athletic performance. And when it does that, that's the time that you need to reach out Yes. For someone who can help you. That person may be a a sports psychologist, a therapist, but that's when you need to reach out to that person. That's not a sign of weakness. Right. It's no different than going to an orthopedic surgeon when you blow your ACL. Exactly. You need that person can help you work through that. Well, I love what you just said, because that's, you know, it's a mindset, right? Oh, I can go to ACL because that's being an athlete, right? right. But wait a minute, I need mental health, you know, and, and I think we're changing that. I know there's a lot of people. There's a lot of, yeah, it is changing rapidly and more conversations like this allow that to become more the norm. You know, here's the crazy thing in in this stat, there's a lot of stats on, you know, depression and suicide and, and how to get out of it and all that. What's interesting. And number one, I'd say, go get professional health. That's the number one thing. It's not me. I'm not a professional. Right. Um, But there's other people who can really help. Uh, But there's also things that that you can do. And um, this, this group we were working with, we, we started working on gratitude as one of the things we do every every week and, and we, we build it into our plan and you say and you use it. Turns out, I had no idea. The CEO calls me up and she says, John, um, you're not going to believe this. This is after about six months or, or eight months of the program. And she says, you know, I'm, I'm privy to the stats of uh, how many of our employees are using um, medication because of depression, right? And, uh, and she says, you know, we're aware of it. We're helping people. We want them to use medication. We want them to get the help. She goes, but here's what's crazy. We've had a 70% decrease in the use of the medication for depression. And she, I said, well, that's amazing. Why is that? She goes, it's because of the gratitude. It's because of the courses we've been having. And I went, wow. I'm not trying to blow my own horn, even though I think that's great, right? But it's like, you got to be kidding me. I had no idea that um, this actually was happening. So the reason I share that is that, um, you know, having a practice when we're feeling good about gratitude is real important because that will give you the strength. It's like lifting weights, right? You'll have the strength that when you do, and you said when, not if, when life presents you, whether you're a student athlete or anybody with some of these challenges, you'll Mm -hmm. you'll have a a better reservoir to, to go in on. So it's, it's ironic. It's more than ironic. It's, it's, it's a life giver. Hey, real quick. Um, and then I want to move into, um, some of your other 
things you've accomplished and, and some of the really cool things in athletics. Cause I bet I love athletics. I was an athlete and uh, I love, you know, what's involved in there, but you said something. Uh, and again, I didn't know we we're going to go down this path that about, um, you know, how do you deal with those really traumatic experiences, whether it's in college athletics or in your own personal life? Uh, here's what's interesting. Here's how the Navy deals with it. Because um, like you said, I've I've lost friends and I mean, you know, have been killed. Um, most of them from, let's say, uh, on the job training kind of stuff. Right. Um, and uh and it can seriously impact a squadron. Uh, you know, on my after the Blue Angels, I went to fighter squadron, flew jets off aircraft carriers, and uh, my my commanding officer, great guy. I'll just call him Fish right now. That was his call sign. Um, was just a great leader. Had done his complete tour. Had a family of like five kids. Um, and on his last flight, the last flight as the commanding officer, he was going to go back to DC in a leadership role. Uh, he got killed. And, um, and so you can imagine the, mm -hmm. the challenge. So, you know, here's how the Navy goes about, or at least in my, in my perspective of how the military goes about it. Uh, we do two things that simultaneously, and it's what you were describing. Uh, they have what they call a CAC officer, which is someone who's assigned to take care of the family. Cause that's the first thing yeah. that, that you need to do. You need to take care of the living. Right. And, and you were talking about your student athletes, everyone yeah. there. And, and there's, by the way, it's a beautiful support structure that comes around the family, people. Um, it's really challenging, but it's there and it's there for anybody. Right. But at the same time, there's a parallel approach going. And this is what's hard for some people to, to, to embrace. And you were saying it at the same time, you do have that director of athletics who stands up and says, hey, it may be a day later, maybe a, you know, a week. I mean, yeah. it varies, right? But says, okay, this is a difficult situation. We're all going to get through it, but we got to keep going. The mission is larger than any yeah. one person. And, uh, and that's actually a beautiful thing too. And yeah. I've noticed that they, they run parallel. They, yeah. It's not one above the other. Um, yeah. Obviously, initially, yes, yeah. you take care of the family, but it's yeah. amazing how quickly, you know, like on the Blue Angels, um, we'll call up an ex-Blue Angel and, and, Hey, we need you. And they're there the next day. Right. right. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of a, it's a beautiful, but hard process to go through. Yeah. And, you know, it's, uh, I mean, in that particular one, and, and there've been lots of other, you know, diff, what I will say difficult situations um, and not speaking specifically to, you know, to that one, but, I would say that one, I mean, the university has our institution. I think most institutions have great, you know, support systems yes. within it. Right. Yes. Um, but one of the reasons I've stayed here at, at UAA for as long as I have um, is the people. Yeah. There, you I, go. there are, we probably have more long-term, coaches here and it's unusual to have coaches who stay as long as they have now are they winning yeah. okay because i think that's the difference in athletics you could be a great person a great coach but at the end of the day you got to win right yeah. so um and yeah but i mean we just have um we have coaches who are not only successful in recruiting student athletes who are prepared Yep. Um, you know, academically, um, but they're doing well, you know, athletically, our women's basketball program, our volleyball program, you know, um, our, our men's women's ski program did fabulously well this last year. What, wait, what, you know, what ski program? What was it? Oh, our men's and women's ski program. Oh, men's and women's. And this yeah. is Alpine and or Nordic? What is it? Because I live in Sun Valley. I'm not it's, Alaska. It's 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 actually we have both. We have Nordic Good. and Alpine. And Good. the way that it's scored, you really only do well at nationals if you have both. Oh, interesting. Nordic okay, and good. Alpine and men and women. See, it's a very that. unique. Um, it's it scored very uniquely. Um, and you know, our division one sports in, um, gymnastics and hockey 
Um, you know, we had a, a really um, horrific financial situation here in the state of Alaska, where both sports were kind of put on the chopping block for a period of time. Hockey was wow. suspended for a year. And that's um, amazing because you guys are excellent at hockey. You're one of the go-to universities. Well, yeah, but you know, it just, um, yeah, but you know, they were talking financial exigency for our institution like three or four years ago. Wow. I mean, talk about, ah, yeah. Um, so it's just, yes, yeah, so you talk about hard times. Um, and that's not even talking about, you know, like the major violation we had back in 2012. Um, my boss got fired, which is part of what leads me to when I happened onto your, happened onto your talk. So again, let's let me we just went full circle. You happened to walk into a talk. I happened to be speaking. It was at the NCAA. It was NACTA. Director. It was NACTA. It was down in Orlando. What does that stand for? You know what it stands for. No one else does. Oh, National, um, gosh, um, National Association of Collegiate Directors of Athletics. Beautiful. Is the, yeah, is the whole, uh, is the whole title, but it's a conglomeration of, um, of, I mean, compliance officers, directors of athletics, um, um, sports information. I mean, you name it. It's like all of the subsets of anybody in, in collegiate athletics are there. Yeah. Um, and I was leaving kind of later. I checked out of my room and I was a little bit late, walked in. You'd already started. And I, I had been through the the two. Um, unfortunate, you know, the suicide, the attempted suicide, um, the major violation, which we had found we're in the middle of because of a a rogue coach. Um, my boss had just been fired the week before. Wow. So talk, and it was like major instability. Things were going, I, I was really thinking about getting out of collegiate athletics Hmm. and I heard your talk and I was like, wait a minute. No, no, I don't have to do that. <laughs> I just have to shift my attitude. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, listening to you talk about, um, um, you know, the, just the whole process of, um, you know, excellence and the debrief and getting continually better and trust. And it just, it was like click for me. Um, and then I started following you and I've been following you ever since. <laughs> wow. Well, so, first up, yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. No, it just, it, it just really resonated with me. And that yeah. was the reason why I wrote that. Thank you. Um, because that's what almost 10 years. Well, yeah. I wrote it the week of NACTA. Cause it oh, was you like, did? Yeah, I wrote it the week that NACTA was going on. And it's like, hey, John, I got to, only because I was thinking about that view that week. Um, I wasn't there. Um, I not I had chosen not to go this year, but I was like, I, I really have to write and thank him. Because I'm getting, re- I'm like, I'm this close to retirement, John. This okay. close. All right. All right. And so, yeah. Um, but yeah. Well, thank you for that. I think, you know, number one, it was beautiful to get a, a letter, heartfelt letter like that. Uh, the reason I wanted you to share on is, is not because of me. I think it's more of what you, what the message did. You know, I think a messenger, it has to flow through them. It's it's not me, right? But if that message actually um, allowed you to um, to continue to give back and look at that was back in 13. So that's almost 10 years ago, right? Yep. So tell me about some of, I'm looking behind you and I see dragons exist oh, and then yeah. dragons can be beaten. Tell me about that. Okay. So yeah. So fairy tales are more than true because they tell us that dragons exist, but, be, um, but because they tell us that dragons can be beaten. Nice. So um, yeah. And I, I kind of resituated just for the podcast. So the things on the wall um, one is a piece of art that our faculty athletic representative did for me. 
Um, and then the other piece is actually a watercolor of the Blue Ridge. Of the um, Blue Ridge Mountains? Mountains or what? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Um, that was a piece of art that um, somebody gave to me. Um, right. And it's, that's what I typically look at when I'm at my desk. And those are important pieces for me. Um, one, I love red poppies for okay. a number of reasons. Um, but uh, the Blue Ridge is where I, I mean, I, I love the Blue Ridge Mountains because I lived in Asheville for a number of years. Yes. Um, and it's just a beautiful area. Um, so it kind of harkens to, I don't know, you know, years of friends and family and, and great, just great memories. But the, 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 the dragon message is really kind of an analogy for me that um, dragons aren't necessarily people, but sometimes they're problems and they're situations. Okay. I um, like it. Yep. Right. That, yeah. yeah, dragons, yeah, it can be beaten. Oh, that's beautiful. I love the idea, you know, not only from a sports analogy, I thought yeah. the dragons were your biggest competitor in, in Anchorage, you know, but no, this is a deeper message. No, yeah, no. and this was before Game of Thrones became popular. I just want you to know. Oh, interesting. <laughs> okay. this, is, this has nothing to do with Game of Thrones. So, yeah, oh, I love it. Yeah. Hey, what is, let, let's keep going on this real quick. What is the, um, some really positive lessons that you've learned through a full career in athletics. Okay. Um, whether it's has to do with the business side or the sports side, tell me, uh, what have you learned that you want to share with everybody? Um, I think that, um, hmm. yikes, the biggest lesson. I think that, um, dealing with the the assumptions um it, it's so easy sometimes um and particularly in compliance because yeah. most of my job um throughout my career here has focused on NCA compliance and I do I monitor the um student athletes academic um progress okay um two areas that can be very ticklish, yeah. right? Um, because with NCA compliance, you're, you're very frequently the unpopular person yes. because you're delivering news that is not always good, right? Yes. Um, but, but in that arena, your integrity and doing things the right way are, are essential. Because if yes. you're not, you're 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 putting your institution at great risk. Yes. Um, and so not just that individual, the institution, and that's absolutely big, see that's that's a huge put, point. You yeah. put everything at risk. Yep. Um, so the thing that I learned very early on was was to very quickly discern um, if there was a problem. Because interpretively, you, you can look at a situation and go, oh, I think that's a problem, but it may not be a problem. Right. So was to figure it out very quickly. And if it was a problem, you got to tell the people who are involved, like now, you, you got to get it. You got to lay it on the table. Oh, hey, where's that laid on the table? Did you take that from where'd you come up with that? Lay it on the table? Yeah. Uh, I. That's, um, I don't know. So it, let me say, bring it up. It, it's, um, you know, it, it, it's, uh, you obviously had that seed planted a while ago. Uh, I use that as one of my uh, four core principles of a glad to be here debrief. God, uh, maybe, I, maybe I got it from you, John. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not trying to claim it, but I like that you said it because lay it on the table is about open and honest. It's about, you, do I have the environment I can tell people, right? Well, it doesn't, and really, it doesn't even matter in my mind whether the environment exists or not. Yeah, in your case, you, yes. you still have to do it. Beautiful. And sometimes it can be very uncomfortable. Oh, yeah. Um, because it 
as I said, in compliance, it, it really doesn't. And people may not want to hear it, but you still right. have to, right? Yeah. Um, so so and, hold on real quick. Give me some skills that you've learned because that's not a, an easy job, you know, to be that person, right? But it is your job. And, and you have a purpose higher than self, the institution. So yep. what have you learned on how to help people who maybe are uncomfortable with bringing something up? You know, how, what, have, what have you learned that, is, that it helps in that situation? Um, I think um, sticking to just the the facts. And I learned very, I was a fairly good writer. Um, very early on, I was very lucky. I came out of um, a prep school, having learned how to actually write well. <laughs> so when I got to college, I was, I was already a pretty good writer, but, um, but that was honed very quickly, becoming mm-hmm. a compliance officer, because you learn how to write very factually without okay. any emotion none because you can't because you cannot if you write with emotion as a compliance officer and I'm not an attorney right. which many compliance people are mm-hmm. um which I think is a great skill I that's just not a skill set I had when I got into it right. um y- you can inflame the situation and you cannot that you cannot that only makes things worse So you really do have to stick to the fact um, of the, what happened, the who, what, where, when. It's almost like a newspaper article, except that I don't want to call it news either. Um, But really the, the summary of, and so you have to talk that way as well. Hmm. Um, Because when talking with a coach or talking with another administrator, or talking with anybody who's more thinking about, oh my God, what's this going to look like? How's this going to yep. come out? How's this? It's like, stop. And and, and so um, I didn't always have it, but I learned, I acquired the skill of this is what I think occurred. This is what I think. And this is how I think we should handle it. Um, and then you, you very quickly learn what mitigating circumstances are. Oh, and tell me more, because that's something that's so true in so many things. What, what do you mean you learn? Well, the, the, the mitigating circumstances are these are things that I think contributed to what happened okay. that, that lessen the degree to which it is serious in okay. nature. Um, and so that, you know, and, and so it's not as serious because, okay. or this is why I think it occurred or anything that contributed to it, not fully being someone's responsibility. Right. Um, and, and I've, I've often thought that if I was going to be an attorney that I never could have been a defense attorney, but, Uh, (laughs) but, but but, too honest. What what do you mean? You couldn't be a defense. Yeah. yeah, I like, I had a boss who told me don't ever play poker DD because you would Uh, lose terribly. Uh, But, but you almost kind of become the defense attorney as a, as a compliance person not because you're not telling the truth, but because you're looking to truthfully mitigate what happened. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and that's the way the NCA sets it up. Like what are the mitigating circumstances? Okay. Um, and sometimes you can't do that. So tell you know, me, I've, yeah. of, I've often wondered where now in, in college athletics, cause we have horrific stories of where things you know, yeah. we're not good. Right. But yeah. there's always a fine line. Right. And uh, well, not always, but let's say there's a fine line. So here's the question. When do you as an institution get to investigate it yourself versus the NCAA coming in? Yeah. When does that flip? You know, um, <laughs> I in our major violation. 
I was the one who found it. Mm -hmm. And, and I was the one who reported it to enforcement. Okay. And I was in the position to get most of the information and I handed it to enforcement. Okay. They were not really in a position to, to, to investigate most of it until we got to a certain point where I, I could not have compelled the individual to, um, to talk to me in an interview. Yeah. Yeah. That's where the, the NCA came in. I mean, there's so much changing right now Is there? with the, with the new constitution that's going on that may affect a lot of the um, enforcement processes. What do you mean the new constitution? What, well, what, is the country words, rewriting a division constitution? One, <laughs> division one, two, and three are going through a, um, like we federated back in the late nineties. So we split and now we're, we're, rewriting and kind of um, bringing together um, part of the the articles, the common areas of the the bylaws. Okay. Um, so it's an interesting time, let me just say. <laughs> oh, I bet. Another I bet. it's another evolution of the NCAA, just let me say. Well I'm glad um, you I'm glad you teed that up because um, I'd like to learn more in the future about, you know, where the NCAA is going. There's so many, so many big things. Hey, Happy for, to talk to you about that. All right. <laughs> that's a whole nother, that's a yeah. whole nother ball of wax, so to speak. Well, I, but, I bet. Um, and, and but the, what, the whole enforcement thing, yeah. you know, it really kind of depends on where the report comes from okay. and the nature of the violation. Yeah. Because if it's something that enforcement doesn't think yeah, it 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 really kind of depends on the nature of the violation and where the report comes from. Okay, that's two key things. Yeah. You know, when you talk about compliance, you do it in athletics, there's compliance in financial services. Compliance is a big thing, right? Um, so I know that that you're an expert on all of that. Uh let's let's wrap this up with some some things that have really uh after your full career, because you said you're this close to retiring, right? Yep. So there's got to be some wisdom in you that you want to share. I know it's in there and, and, you, and you've been sharing it, but what is what would be some of the wisdom that you would tell that young girl who you were getting out of uh, school uh, who maybe did or didn't want to become part of athletics, but um, what would, what wisdom would you would you share with her? Because I think what's also beautiful is the number of women in athletics now, not just playing, but trying to get into the sports, you know, the, the administration side. And I know you were one of the early ones. I bet you were. Very, so so, what wisdom would you share? Um, I think I would share. You know, one, don't be afraid to you know, start, um, in, uh, in a position that doesn't start with assistant or associate, as I mentioned earlier, it's great. Work um, your way up, start at the bottom. If yeah. You, you know, okay. I mean, it's, we have, we have positions right now that we're advertising that are not glamorous, but it's yep. a great, it's a great way to get your foot in the door. That's beautiful. And we cannot get people to apply for them. Wow. And it's really too bad because if you're talented, willing to um, learn and it's be the perfect entry. But anyway. Um, well, let, let, me, um, let, me, let, me, let me add that while you're thinking about your second note here. And that is, I think that's so critical in every aspect of life, not just college athletics. Yeah. If there's something you want to do, um, volunteer your time. Yep. Become, you know, my first job wasn't even a job. I told the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, hey, I'll give you a month of my services if you teach me how to run this company. He said, yes. You know, now I didn't get paid, zero. But the right. knowledge I got, was you know yep. life changing. So I think you're yeah. that's a real nice point of wisdom is yep. get your foot in the door. Door. 
like, yeah. And it, the, the job itself may not be like that may not be glamorous and right. it may not be all that fulfilling, but you could learn so much more. Okay, um, cool. And Number I mean, I think, two. yeah, the other thing is don't take yourself too seriously. Ah. Um, you know, I didn't, I just, I was there to learn. I was not, I was gonna, you know, I was going to work um, hard and I did. I mean, I started, you know, like around 1985. Um, so we're talking about right at the resurgence of Title IX and um, gender equity. Um, and, you know, thankfully the NCAA had kind of forged a seat at the table for women with the senior woman administrator title. Um, Wait a minute, what is that? What is that? So the NCAA um, forged a, a, a title that was required. They put it in their, their articles of the constitution that said every institution will name a position in their athletic department of a senior woman administrator, not senior women's administrator, a senior woman administrator. Yes. Meaning that you're most senior and you can designate for, it doesn't have to be the person, the female who's been there the longest, but a senior woman administrator, in other words, who has decision-making authority, who is a part of your senior management team, et cetera. Um, that, in, that female was meant to have a seat at the, the decision-making table. Yep. Now, ironically, there were some institutions who actually named a male to that How position. That? Yeah. Just, that didn't last for long. But anyway, yeah, good. Um, so, and that certainly helped. Um, but, and I was lucky enough to, to have been named to that position at my previous institution. And I, I had that title um, I serve as that position here as well. Excellent. Um, but I think sometimes, um, and when I say don't take yourself too seriously, I, I, I'm not trying to be flippant, but I think, um, women can also, um, kind of pigeonhole themselves to mm. an extent. Um, I think you've got to, you've got to work hard. And in my experience, particularly early on, I had to work a little harder than some of the men, um, to, uh, to to get the positions that I got, um, and sometimes didn't get paid as much. Mm. Um, but even that has changed and has it, that's that, that was where my question was going and and just raw. I, I hope you can answer it is. What is the status of women in athletics, both from an administration and an athlete standpoint? You know, you've been part of the system for better or worse for 30 years. Yeah. Where is it right now? Is it equitable? Is there opportunity Um, for women? Oh, I think, you know, I still think that we're lagging behind in, you know, female head coaches for women's sports. Okay. Um, you know, we do here and that's not for lack of trying. Um, every time we, we try to hire, you know, for, a, a head coach, our pool, and I don't know whether it's geography, um, or whatever here in Alaska that we're just not as attractive maybe, um, to, to female head coaches. Um, uh, no, but that doesn't answer the nationwide. We're st- yep. we still lag, in my opinion, in the stats that I've seen. The NCAA has done great things to try to promote that and okay. to better that stat. Um, I think, in terms of administration, however, um, at least here for a period of time, the the women actually outnumbered the men. <laughs> wow! Congratulations. So, for for whatever reason now i think we're just about even about okay. mm-hmm. so um but 
you know, I mean, across the country, I think you probably, I can't remember the latest stats on administrators, but surely you're not seeing the same number of women who are coming from the student athlete pools into coaching or into administration for whatever reason. Um, okay. And I don't have the answer for that. Well, um, I, I was going to ask you something here. I, you know, I yeah. don't know. Yeah. Um, what do we do? You know, we've been asking ourselves that for a long time. And I don't know. I don't know why, because I've had a lot of young ladies here go, you have the coolest job. Yeah. I'm like, so you want to shadow me for a while? Oh, no, 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 no. That's not what I want to do. And I'm like, really? Why not? Wow. You know, and I'm like, but if you think it's cool, yeah. no, but see, I'm a social work major and I really want to do this. Yeah. I'm like, okay, all right, well. There's a little social work in what I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you like, know, we just hit on something. I think you just said it is to shadow you. And I think you can be and are a mentor for many people. And I think um, every person who is in that position, whether male or female, but specifically yeah. for a woman, should be mentoring somebody, right? Yep. To let them know how cool is this. Um, yeah. And I like what you said also, it might not be sexy the, the, to get started. You know, I mean, I, I got to be honest with you, the compliance is not the sexiest position, but it gets you where you can make an impact. And I, I think yep. that that's got to be pretty cool. Yeah. Well, and it's not, you know, compliance is not for the lighthearted, I will tell you. Yeah, there you go. Um, it's not, <laughs> I mean, it was one of the hardest transitions that I have ever made, um, you know, business is black and white. That's easy. Yeah. Like it, it just is what it is. And when you're doing budget meetings, the coaches may not like you, but they understand that part a whole lot yep. better. Yep. Compliance is interpretative. Ah. Um, it's not, it's like, Oh, but you might be wrong. They're doing it this way someplace at so-and-so institution. Right. Right. It's like, yeah, but I'm not the compliance officer at so-and-so institution. Right. Right. So, but no, I mean, other things that I've learned is just, um, you know, um, oh, gosh, there's so much I've learned. I'm almost speechless. Uh -huh. make, uh, here, here we go. No, I'm going to make it easy because this is the way I like to think about it is, and, and it's kind of our, our, our last wrap up. I'm going to ask you two questions. Um, one is, and this may tee up the second one is what are you grateful for? What does glad to be here mean to you right now? Oh. Oh, um, gosh, that does make it so much easier. Um, you know what? I am grateful for the, the people who I work with every day. Okay. That's, there is no way that I would have lasted almost 30 years here had it not been the people I worked with. No okay. way. The team here and the colleagues who I've had you know, over the, the number of years that I've been here, that's, that's priceless. And, and you know, when you go to, I mean, it, it, and sometimes I, 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 it's, it's an analogy of like going to battle because sometimes it has been honestly, I mean, it's like going to battle to save a program, to save our department, those are the people who I've been side by side with for the last 30 years. And I couldn't wow. have done it. You know, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's the people I work with. Absolutely. There you go. It's so important. Yeah. I, I hear that so often in yeah. many different companies, not just athletics, you know, people first, but what I remember, I know for me, you know, I, I remember my teammates, but I also remember yeah. the impact you had on kids and all that. It, it, it is about people. Right. Um, yeah. And yeah, you get to do cool things. You get to play athletics and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, how about this? I'm, I'm, I'm going to end on um, that sign behind you, but I want yeah. something else. And that is, do you have a saying? Do you have a motto, a quote? You know, athletics is always um, keen on having quotes that, uh, that you live by, that motivates you. We already got the one because it's in front of your desk every single day. The, the dragons exist, but dragons can be beaten. I think, by the way, that is the takeaway. But do you have another one or something you learned in life? Hmm. 
Yeah. And it's, you know, it's one that, um, that my dad, um kind of instilled in me and it's it's kind of like don't cross the bridge before you get to it and it's it's all about don't don't spend your time worrying about that which hasn't happened there you go and you know it's so easy to do um and and particularly in athletics um there's so many things that could go wrong (laughs) yeah that, well, I mean, in anything really, but I, I don't spend a lot of time worrying. Um, I don't get stressed about things. I do my best to plan events, issues, and then just sit back and it's like, okay, well, if it, something goes wrong, we'll deal with that. There you go. Because you just can't, you know, you, you do your best to, to plan, practice. And then once you get into the implementation phase, you just got to let it roll. Yeah. Probably not the that. way you pilot, <laughs> probably not the way you fly. Well, yeah, no, <laughs> no, it's different, but, but you can't, I mean, like when, when people freak out over something, it's like, no, you got, no, stop, stop. Do you got to do, it's like, no, 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 we're in the middle of it. <laughs> just stop. Just let it go because they're not going to notice that. <laughs> you know, it's like, so, well, you know, it, it hits two notes to me. One is, um, of course, you mentioned it. You plan, you execute, you debrief. There's lots of process that's in, in life, right? But um, it doesn't mean you don't look at contingencies. Oh, something could go wrong. Here's what it is. What you're talking about, and I, I believe 100%, is the idea of worry, right? And, yeah. and they, you know, there's lots of stats out there, but one I saw was, and, and it's random, but 99% of the things we worry about never occur anyhow. Right. So why waste the energy? And by the way, it is energy and it's, and yes. it, it is going to affect the way you see the world. So yep. see it from a positive standpoint, be aware yeah. of something, but let's make a difference. And, and you've been doing that. So, um, uh, all right, Dee, Dee listen, we're going to give you a call sign as we wrap this up. Uh, Uh-oh. Sugar, sugar came up with Dee Dee Dallas Allen, and the, <laughs> tell me, yeah, look at, I think it fits. Why? Because I was born in Dallas, and and I think aren't the the Cowboys? Who is something else? Right? Yep. Okay, sugar. How did you do that? <laughs> he's 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 brilliant, and he uh, know, well, I mean, like Dallas. And the Dallas Cowboys are like the, like, I follow the Dallas Cowboys. N- not because like, I like everything about them, sure, but it's because that's where I was born and you got to follow, you know, so. Follow your heart. You're a real fan. I mean, uh, and, uh, and I, and that's why, you know, uh, Alaska is, is precious to have you. Um and thank with you. that, the Sea Wolves. I want to say, Dee, thank you. A lot of wisdom came through on this. Uh, and uh, I look forward to seeing you in Alaska someday. I hope Here's so. Take care, John. Bye now. Bye.